AM 590, KXSP Omaha's ESPN Radio. It's time for the Metro's only racing talk show. The Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Now, here's Dan Taylor and Buddy Ray. Good morning, race fans, and welcome to the Front Stretch, presented by Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs, online at joeskarting.com. That's karting with a K. We've got a lot to get to today, so let's just tell you what we're going to talk about. In turn four, we'll preview New Hampshire Motor Speedway as the NASCAR boys are headed to Loudoun. In turn three, we'll talk with Ben McNair, head athletic trainer for Creighton, works with basketball and soccer. He'll talk about proper hydration for you race fans and for the drivers. In turn two, we'll sit down with Dr. Dean Sicking, formerly of UNL, who helped design the Safer Barriers. Before we get to all of that, turn one, we're going to talk with our good friend Jeff Striegel over at the Motor Racing Network. Jeff, it's been a little while since we've talked to you. We've missed you. <laughs> I've missed you guys as well, and we've uh, put a couple of races in the book. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, like you guys just said, whether you're talking dirt track, short track, or you know Daytona, or now getting ready to preview New Hampshire, there's a lot to talk about in the world of racing. Oh yeah, and, and it's uh, it's yeah. There, there has been so much that has happened. Let's let's start off with as much as you, you're you're kind of our guy on the inside, and, and we're going to uh, probably build up a bigger image than, than maybe is is actually true. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're the through the Jason board of spying as far as insider news for NASCAR for me. These okay. these spacers that that you know when we recorded, we hadn't found out if NASCAR had penalized the teams at all for this happening. Have you had a chance to talk to anybody on the uh, down in NASCAR about what's going on with these things? No, you know, not not to the point where I could give you, a, hey, this is exactly why NASCAR was upset about it, or you know, we're really going to slap their hands, you know, because they've done something, you know, illegal. I think, uh, you know, like the, the three of us, I think we're all kind of waiting to see just exactly how NASCAR responds. And the reason why I say that is this. From what I've been able to tell, that these roof laps that uh, would we have 16 teams in the Sprint Cup Series, I think there was 15 teams or something like that in the Nationwide Series. Right. Um, none of it was designed to give the car more downforce, give it better speed. Uh, it was simply a, a matter of the teams putting together the roof lap the way that they felt like it needed to go about. But let's be clear about something. You know, we go back to, uh, I guess it was Penske um, that had the uh, rear ends that were put in those cars that uh, got so much press, right? Right. The issue, while there was some things that weren't right about what they were doing, the issue was the fact that NASCAR didn't stamp it, didn't see it, didn't touch it. NASCAR didn't approve it. And as amazing as it may sound, there's not, you know, many parts on those race cars that NASCAR doesn't touch physically uh, and look at and give approval to. In this particular case, with those roof laps, that's exactly what happened. They were not NASCAR approved. Doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just means that you did not follow the rule. Don't put something on the race car unless we've approved it. And that's what took place at Daytona. Is this going to be, do you think the penalties that happen are, are going to be in the same category as like what happened with Martin Truex? And I believe it was following Kansas to where he was fined for having his car too low and it was because of a shock malfunction. Nothing that they did on purpose to cheat. It was just something that happened during the race. Do you think it's going to be a similar kind of a fine where it's like a six-point championship fine? You know, if I was going to guess, I'd say yeah. Um you know, NASCAR, NASCAR has, we're, we're going to roll our eyes. You know, we're, you know, let's just say, for example, they hand out a $25,000 fine and they dock somebody six points, 10 points, 15, whatever it is. We're all going to roll our eyes and go, you got to be kidding me. You know, they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't uh, do something to cheat the car up, you know, to make it go faster than a competitor. But what NASCAR's got to stand on is the simple rule that says, if you do something, tell us. We've got to approve it. And so don't be surprised at all if, if they get a suspension and point deduction that is pretty, you know, pretty strong because NASCAR has the right to say, here's the rules that we expect you to follow. When you don't follow them, we're going to consider them broken. Don't care if that's an illegal lug nut or an illegal engine. The fact of the matter is, it's illegal, and you knew that before you moved ahead with your plan and your process. 
Let's talk about those point standings as we walk into New Hampshire Motor Speedway. And the top eight, it's close, but it's not real close. But when you talk about eighth through 20th, you're talking about one bad race and you go from being in the chase and having a great season to really struggling. Have you seen a points race like this in the number of years that that would that you can kind of compare it to? No, not really. Um, this is uh, this is what NASCAR you know wanted to do when they brought this opportunity to race for you know a, a chance at racing for a championship. I like it. You know, it's what we uh, tried to. You know, obviously, it's what they tried to do when they brought this in after Matt Kenseth won the championship. What was it in two thousand and two or whatever it was? I like it. Um, you know, Kurt Busch right now loves it. Uh, you take a look at a guy like Martin Truex Jr. who hates it, you know, because, <laughs> you know, both those guys swap spots um, this time around coming out of Daytona. Um, you're right. There is no more mulligan. If you're going to have a bad race and you're 8th through 20th, you might as well just, you know, load the car and the transporter as far as racing for the championship goes because you're not going to get it. Um, Tony Stewart it, it can't afford to have a 34th place finish. Uh, Martin Truex Jr. can't afford to have another 34th place finish. Um, you you've got to bring your A game, and I'm going to allow you. Or I'm going to help you transition to the guys that are really got things going on. You've got to run now, like Kevin Harvick has been running for the last what nine or ten races. I mean, you've got to come there focused on finishing in the top ten every single weekend or you will be on the outside looking in when we uh, get to Richmond and, and wrap up to see who's going to run for the championship. Jeff, I want to talk about, uh, you said you know you got to be on top of your game, and there's guys running really good right now, and you mentioned a couple of them, but I want to focus on Matt Kenseth. Man alive, <laughs> that guy this year has come alive. Do you solely give a lot of the credit, and he's run good in the past, and he's got a championship already, but have do you think him going over to JGR has helped him that much more, and if you think so, I think it has. What is about him and JGR that man? They just gel good together. Well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be as as blatant and obvious as I can, uh, and I'm gonna turn the question around and I'm gonna pose something different back to you. I'm gonna make you a team owner for a minute, buddy. Uh, I'm gonna give you your choice. You can have Kyle Busch and his equipment, or you can have Greg Biffle and his equipment. Who are you gonna take? Uh, I'm taking Kyle Busch all day long. There you go. Uh, you know, I, I recognize the fact that Denny Hamlin is down, so I'm still going to pose it, though. You can have Denny Hamlin and his equipment, or you can have Carl Edwards and his equipment. Who are you going to take? Wow. Uh, if I had to take one, Denny Hamlin and his equipment. All right. Now we're going to take Matt Kenseth and say, you know, Matt, you've got an opportunity to drive for Roush Fenway, or you've got an opportunity to drive for Joe Gibbs. Matt Kenseth is a championship-winning driver. All he needed was the rest of the team around him, the equipment around him, that would allow him to really showcase just how good Matt Kenseth is. Uh, no, I'm not taking anything away from Roush Fenway. Those guys bring some, you know, very good Fords to the racetrack. However, you know, year in and year out, yeah, Matt can go out and win races. But, you know, other than Carl Edwards a couple years ago when he, when he and Tony put on that great show, those guys are not in championship position. They're not capable of winning races week in and week out. Denny Hamlin and Kyle Busch are in position to win races. I don't care where we go. Could be a road course. Could be Martinsville, Talladega. It doesn't matter. Those guys have got cars that are capable of winning. So you take a good driver like Matt Kenseth that's, that's mature, patient, understands the sport, knows how to communicate with a quality crew chief, all of a sudden you've got, you know, a Super Bowl winning, you know, team. When and you, I think that that's what we're seeing right now. When you bring Matt Kenseth to the table, if you're JGR and you bring Matt Kenseth to the table, are you excited about the maturity that he brings to the team that, you know, he can kind of look over Denny Hamlin and say, you know, hey, young man, you know, I've been around a lot longer than you. Uh, do you think that's really helped Denny in a lot of ways? I hope it's helped Kyle, too. Um, yeah. Yes. Emphatically, yes. Um, I thought the move was bold. Um, you know, I was curious to see how Denny and Kyle would take Matt coming over. And, you know, because let's face it, Denny and, and Kyle, you know, they can argue amongst themselves. I'm the number one driver on this team. No, you're not. I am. And they can argue all day long. 
Then all of a sudden you get, you know, the word that Matt Kendrick is now your teammate. Well, now who's number one? And, you know, the bottom line is let's go out and settle it on the racetrack. Uh, let's not argue about it. Let's go out and do our job. And uh, obviously right now, Matt is, you know, in my opinion, Matt's the guy who's leading that team. If it wasn't for bad luck, um, Matt would be right there contending with Jimmy for the championship. And I, you know, if Kevin Harvick can keep doing what he's doing, Jimmy does what he's doing, and Matt's doing what he's doing, I think when we get to Homestead, it's going to be the three of those guys that will be the, the ones contesting for the championship. Had Denny not been injured this year at Auto Club, do you see Denny right there cha- challenging for the championship with Jimmy and Matt? <laughs> it's funny that you ask that question because at the beginning of, I think, the last five straight years, I've been asked, you know, from one radio station or another to say, all right, who's going to win the championship this this year and who is it that could dethrone Jimmy Johnson? And every year I've answered the same question or the, the question the same way, Denny Hamlin. I, I don't know if I could speculate to, to the way you phrased that. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, Denny's a championship capable winning driver. If everything was to work out for him, it hasn't. Um, and he's found himself on the short end of the stick, you know, sometimes because of things that he may have done on the racetrack or, or, you know, the fact that they blew a tire or lost an engine or he got in a wreck at California and that put him out. Um, he's very capable of winning a championship, and I think he does before his career is over. Would it have come this year? Man, that's, that's something I really can't answer. I don't know. Let's talk about the Coke Zero 400 that happened last weekend. We hadn't had a chance to kind of talk to you about it. It was a dramatic difference than we saw at the Daytona 500. Teams really seem to have a handle on this Gen 6 car for the uh, restrictor plate races. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. Um, And I think that based on what we saw there this year, instead of laying back uh, like we saw some drivers do, Kevin Harvick did it and came back and finished. Here's what's interesting. I was just going to say all the drivers now would want to get out front and lead, right? But yet, Jimmy Johnson laid back won the race. Tony Stewart laid back, finished second, and Harvick laid back. I mean, I don't know. I believe we were on lap 120, and Harvick was running 41st, if I'm not mistaken. And he rallies back and finishes third. Um, But my point was going to be, if you could get your car out front, and I don't think it mattered if it was a, a Chevy SS, if it was a Ford, or if it was a Toyota, if you could just get it out front, nobody could pass you. Now, that's the downside of what we saw. Uh, you know, it was one against 42 with Jimmy looking like a pace car at 200 miles an hour and nobody able to get by him. That clean air on those cars uh, just is obviously, you know, the difference between winning and losing. So, you know, yes, I think they're a whole lot better with those race cars today. I think they continue to learn, and I think by the time we get to Daytona, uh, in February, we're going to see you know an even better race, an even more competitive race, and I was very, very happy with what we saw over the 4th of July weekend. We were talking off air. You've got about a three-week break as uh, different entities are going to be calling the races. What are you going to do with yourself? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what does a, what does a, a, a race guy do on an off weekend? Goes to the racetrack, right? <laughs> <Yeah. There's> a, <laughs> I'm planning on going to the racetrack. Uh, at least two out of those three weekends. We've got a little racetrack up here called the Berlin Raceway, and uh, we've got a car that runs out there. So that is what I'm going to be doing that and hopefully uh, sitting around with my feet up because it's been a long first half of the year, and we've got a long ways to go. And, and it's it, oddly enough, it's going by fast, yet, it re- I mean, it isn't. It's it's like we're all tired, but it's like, oh, it just went by halfway. Halfway's done already, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you start thinking about it's mid-July already, yeah. and you just you go, I don't even remember May, and all of a sudden we're talking about the end of summer fast approaching. It won't be long, and, and we really will be in Richmond, and the three of us will be sitting around talking about who got in and, and who missed the opportunity. It's going to be a great time. I can't wait for it. Let's uh, we'll, we'll put you on hold for just a minute, and then we'll talk about the return to Loudon in turn four. How's that sound? 
That sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot. Jeff Striegel of the Motor Racing Network. He'll join us again in turn four to preview New Hampshire Motor Speedway as we head to Loudoun. Thanks for, for hanging out. This is the Front Stretch on AM 590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. The Silver Dollar Nationals at I-80 Speedway are less than a week away. Time is running out to get your tickets and see the nation's top USMTS, MLRA, and Lucas Oil dirt late model racers as they compete at Nebraska's fastest track. Come watch the nation's best dirt races compete for a $27,000 to win payout. Ticket prices and packages at 402 342 3453 The third annual Silver Dollar Nationals at I-80 Speedway this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. In 1999, Wade Cross decided he was tired of overpaying for shocks, so he created FX Shocks. Now FX suspension customers reach across the United States with countless wins and championships, including national champion in three major IMCA classes, plus Super Nationals champions in all four of the Saturday night's main events. Get your FX shocks today. One-on-one consultation is waiting for you at 308 383 9609. This is Andrew from Kaziski Auto Parts. Kaziski Auto Parts is an insurance quality used parts supplier that can match your foreign or domestic car or truck needs. If you have a damaged or broke down car or truck, we guarantee a clean and quality part in next day fashion. Kaziski Auto Parts, your neighborhood premium recycle parts supplier. Call any Kaziski Auto Parts salesman today by dialing 402 731 4592 or visit us at 5040 I Street in Omaha. Kaziski Auto Parts, our quality used parts will match your car or trucks needs. Are you ready for fast-paced, adrenaline-pumping, wheel-to-wheel racing right here in the Metro? Get to Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs and see what it's like to race real go-karts. Joe's Karting knows it's no fun to race go-karts at 10 miles per hour, so they ripped the governors out, and now the only restriction is how good you are at racing. It's full-throttle, white-knuckle racing every day of the week. Head over to joeskarting.com for hours, prices, and specials, or give Buddy a call today and set up your group races at 712-256-5278. We're working the high line into turn two on the front stretch, presented by Joe's Carding, online at joescarding.com. And turn two is presented by I-80 Speedway. The Silver Dollar Nationals are just around the corner. Make sure you get your tickets as they are selling very quickly. I-80speedway.com is where you can go to get more information. Joining us on the phone now is Dr. Dean Sicking, formerly of UNL, helped create these safer barriers that NASCAR uses, and since their implementation has saved many lives. Dr. Sicking, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ann. Honored to on your show. We wanted to talk to you today because the uh, the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series is getting ready to head to Eldora Speedway, which is probably one of the more notorious dirt tracks throughout the area. We wanted to talk to you a little bit. We had a conversation with you last year before the Daytona 500, and a lot has happened since then, obviously, especially with the accident at Auto Club Speedway and Danny Hamlin hitting a non-safer barrier protected wall. So I wanted to have a conversation with you, kind of refresh the memory of, of fans about how the safer barrier works. So if you could start there, just kind of describe exactly how the safer barrier protects drivers from well, major incident, major uh, uh, major injuries. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to discuss that again because it's uh, many of the pundits don't understand it. And so uh, I'll try again to explain it. Basically, the... Uh, Safer barrier utilizes a rigid steel wall that uh, that rings the track. And between the wall and the concrete barrier behind it are some foam blocks. And the principle behind the safer barrier is that uh, upon first impact with a steel wall, the car slows down and, and will typically lose about half of its speed perpendicular to the, to the wall. And the wall will, will uh, absorb a lot of the energy. And then, so so the driver gets a pretty good pulse but, but again, it's it's relatively small because it's only about half speed. And then as as, as the wall moves back, the driver's now you know, stretching his seat belts out, and uh, the wall is continuing to move further back. And the driver's seat seat belts will reach maximum extension, and and start pulling him back toward his seat. And once he's headed back toward his seat, it doesn't matter how hard we hit the hit the car at that point. He's not going to feel it because he's traveling in the other direction. Right. It's that kinematic principle of uh, we we delay the second impact until until the point in time that the driver is moving in the opposite direction that really makes the safer barrier work. And and in our testing, we've seen reductions in neck tension, which is the most common cause of fatal crashes and in, in, involving the wall. We see the neck tension be cut by a factor of four, or seventy five percent reduction. 
and then he gets there by uh, by basically to breaking the the crash into two 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 separate impacts. And the second one is 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 when the steel wall hits the concrete barrier, and during and, and we delay it to the point the driver is going the opposite direction when that happens. And, and that helps to reduce the shock impact, correct? Right. The, the driver never feels the second one. Okay. And I'm I'm honestly ever since we had a conversation with you last year, I'm honestly shocked at the amount of give that comes with those steel uh, the steel wall at the beginning. You know, the NASCAR the, the the TV broadcast show the replay a lot when these drivers hit that wall. And I on I didn't realize before we talked to you last time that that was a that was a hollow steel beam, correct? Right, hollow steel tubes there. Yeah, still eight very by eight rigid. By three sixteen. Still very rigid, but how much they move in that impact because of the amount of force that's hitting them. Absolutely. It, it, typically, in that primary impact, that first impact, will the driver will pull or the, the car will pull thirty or forty Gs, which is a very very safe level for a driver. And mm-hmm. with when when they're in a cockpit like it might NASCAR runs, so so forty Gs times a thirty six hundred pound car, that's uh, roughly. 150,000 pounds force. That's a lot of a lot of force to put on the barrier. <laughs> yeah, it is. I completely agree. And one of the other criteria for building this was that it would be easily replaceable in case of an accident, which obviously that's going to happen. How hard was it to create that that wall that was easily replaceable uh, in the, in when an accident does happen? Well, the, there were two primary problems. One is how do you design a joint so we we can make it function and not not have the, the splice or splice these things together be a safety hazard. That was the biggest problem we encountered during the during this design effort. The second thing is is then okay, now you in, you you design the splice so it's not safety hazard. How do you come out how do you make that splice still uh, removable after it gets hit? And that that proved to be a, a bridge too far. We, we basically had to had to accept, accept that when a car strikes the barrier where, near a splice, and, and, and you need to re, you need to replace it, you have to replace both sections. Okay. You just can't take the splice apart after it's been bent; it just won't happen. Yeah. But once we once we accepted that that we were we're going to sacrifice that joint and we just have to place replace two two pieces, then it was relatively uh, easy to make it work. Basically, all we had to do was design a splice that would survive the the impact. And then make it easy to take part after the after the fact when when it hadn't been hit. So that part was pretty good. That it, wasn't, leads, it wasn't as hard as we anticipated. That leads me on to my next series of questions. And we had an incident on the dirt track series just a couple of weeks ago where a, a driver lost his life uh, in an accident where he'd hit the wall, and it later determined that it was a blunt force trauma to the head when he hit a uh, a uh, reinforcing beam in his car. Now. A lot of people questioned, well, is this is it time for dirt tracks to start going towards the safer barriers? And, and we went back to your original interview, and you had said that the walls that we had put in place for NASCAR will not work on the dirt track level. The problem with the dirt track is most of those cars are too light. And then, number one, they're too light. Number two, they're too soft. If you, uh, for example, if you take a passenger car, mm-hmm. typical passenger car, and, and drive it in, into the wall, the wall doesn't move. Right. Now, the passenger car just gets crushed. The, the wall never moves an inch because it's designed for much stiffer, much higher energy impact than what you're going to get out of the spring car. Yeah, and and you had mentioned that too that it, it, it because it's so stiff, it would do absolutely no good. Now, you had also designed safer safer barrier like when you design a barrier for the highway systems throughout the country. Those those seem to be less replaceable. Like I talked about with the NASCAR uh, safer barrier walls, where they were sectioned, where they could easily be replaced in, in a decent amount of time. Is well, here, is there anything here it comes that, down to cost? The uh, highway agencies just flat don't have the money to put up barriers that don't need to repair unless it's made out of concrete. And as everybody knows, there's not a lot of energy management in concrete, and it's not the safest they can they can get. Yeah. So they only put those in places where where they absolutely have to have them. Is there a gap between the safer barriers and what you designed for everyday? Consume, uh, everyday drivers on the highways that, that they could implement something that could soften the blow a little bit. We have been working on a, a variation of the safer barrier for highways for use in real high high risk locations, mm-hmm. and uh, it's been a challenge. There's just not a lot of money available for the uh, kind of uh, treatment we're putting on a racetrack. 
and, you know, the, as far as the racing community goes, $500 a foot, which is what secondary costs, is not a big deal because if you save one guy's um, season, not even not even his uh, slide, but let's say he, you keep him from being injured such that he, he gets to race the rest of the season that, and that he otherwise wouldn't have, that pays for the for the barrier at every at the end of at least one track, maybe two. Yeah. So the the money for the, the states have, in particular, uh, right now, is is much more restrictive. And so <clears throat> we're trying to build a safer barrier version for highways that's a hundred dollars a foot, which is which for highway barrier that's a very expensive barrier. Most most guardrails and, and bridge rails are somewhere in the twenty to fifty dollars per foot mm-hmm. range. So we're we're our target design cost is twice what state DOTs normally normally pay, and so uh, it's a uh, difficult stretch for them to even con- even consider going above that. And so that's that's the challenge is keeping the cost down. It comes down to making making highway safer. Always falls down to you have to make it safer at a price that the state DOTs can afford, and that's that's always the big big crunch. And it's it's never ending struggle. One question I have is: over the past twenty, thirty years, there's been a lot of advancement in NASCAR IndyCar series that has trickled down to the highways in today's cars. Do you see these safe, safer barriers in Indy and NASCAR trickling down to where okay, well, we use this NASCAR. We sh- maybe we should put this on the highway. Well, uh, the, the barrier we're working on right now, uh, we have been working on for several years actually. Is is to bridge that gap, take that technology and put it on the highway at a cost that the state can afford. We think we're close. And so, yes, I, I, without a doubt, I think this is going to happen. I don't think you'll see it lining all the highways because, uh, you know, states just don't have that kind of money. But I think they'll be able to, to identify their high-risk locations. They'll be, they'll, they, they will now have a tool, well, they then have a tool that can be used to ameliorate those, those difficult situations. Yeah, and you see NASCAR doing the same thing. I assumed that all the walls in NASCAR were covered by the safer barrier, but we learned this at Auto Club and several tracks throughout the area that NASCAR did an assessment of the high-risk areas and placed the walls there. And then uh, all the walls that they don't think were high-risk, they didn't require the tracks to place them there to save money. Now, wasn't it just to save money when the, when they first implemented the safer barrier? Remember, uh, NASCAR's mandate was that it had to be on, on all tracks in the 2004 season. That meant that the, per, the enterprising company that had built the first one at Indianapolis went out and they bought up all the available tubing in the U.S. that they could get their hands on that was the right size and strength characteristics. And, and, and then we used, it, we used it all up. So there just wasn't enough material available in, on this planet to build bring all, all, all of the NASCAR tracks both wow. inside and outside. There just, just wasn't enough steel tubing of 8 by 8 by 3 sixteenths available anywhere. I see. I appreciate you setting me straight on that because I, I was uh, a little frustrated with NASCAR, assuming that it was a money issue, but I appreciate you setting me straight on that. A uh, couple of last questions here today. Have you ever seen an accident through a replay, maybe one that just happened last weekend at, at Daytona, or maybe the one that happened at Daytona 500 with the uh, uh, and during the Nationwide Series, and you see a driver hit that wall and bounce off and walk away? Do you ever think to yourself, the work I have done has allowed him to walk away, and, and I essentially saved his life? You don't think of it that way, but you think of it, at least the way I think of it is, we did good that time. And uh, the moment that I remember, and we will never forget, when uh, Kurt Busch spun that, got spun out by Spencer mm-hmm. at the at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and we lived in 2003, and he slammed the driver's door into the safer barrier, and I got in, and I saw a whole lot going, oh my God, because I was watching that portion of the race, mm-hmm. and when he got out and flipped off Spencer, I said, well, it did its job. <laughs> Yeah, you, you allowed you allowed him to be the uh, the the bush that he was. <laughs> yeah, and he didn't realize how close he came to dying. I don't think. Well, I, I yeah, you've done a tremendous job. We you know we we thank you in silence every time that these drivers walk away for your your research and the team and the work you did while you were at UNL. Uh, and uh, I thank you again tonight for taking the time out of your day to talk with us. We always do appreciate it. Again, this is Dr. Dean Sicking of University of Alabama, Birmingham. Have a good night, Doctor. And, uh, again, thank you so much, and we can't wait to talk to you again. My pleasure. Call me anytime. All Bye-bye. right. Thank you. Dr. Dean Sicking, now of the University of Alabama, Birmingham.
We'll be back in turn two. We'll have a conversation with Ben McNair, the lead trainer for Creighton University Basketball. Talk to us about hydration for dirt track drivers. It's all coming up next on the front stretch, presented by Joe's Carding on AM 590 Omaha's ESPN Radio. For 50 years, Eagle Raceway has been pushing the limits of dirt track racing. Saturday nights, come see the Midwest's best battle at the fastest third-mile track. Gates open at 5.30 for IMCA Modifieds, Sport Compacts, Hobby Stocks, Sport Mods, and Race Saver Sprint Cars. Eagle kicks their season off on April 19th with the Icebreaker Challenge, featuring the debut of the Race Saver Sprint Cars. Located just 10 minutes east of Lincoln on Highway 34 and online at eagleraceway.com. And all kinds of other tempting things. Great times, great food. Get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Quaker Steak and Lube is the official watering hole for the front stretch and the best place to catch all the NASCAR action today. Open at 11 a.m. with delivery available to Council Bluffs. Great times, great food. Get to Quaker Steak and Lube. Are you ready for fast-paced, adrenaline-pumping, wheel-to-wheel racing right here in the Metro? Get to Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs and see what it's like to race real go-karts. Joe's Karting knows it's no fun to race go-karts at 10 miles per hour, so they ripped the governors out, and now the only restriction is how good you are at racing. It's full-throttle, white-knuckle racing every day of the week. Head over to joeskarting.com for hours, prices, and specials, or give Buddy a call today and set up your group races at 712-256-5278. Time to grab another tear-off and make your move. We're headed into turn three on the front stretch, presented by Joe's Carding. Heading into turn three, presented by Crawford County Fair in Denison, Iowa. It all kicks off Wednesday, July 24th with Nebraska 360 Sprint Cars, Late Models, and Vintage Car Races. And it wraps up Sunday, July 28th with their annual Fair Figure 8 Races along with RV Camper Races. A lot of action in between then. Head to Crawford County, Iowa Fair for more information. We're joined on the phone now by Ben McNair, who is the lead athletic trainer for Creighton. Works primarily with Bass basketball and soccer and Ben we wanted to talk to you today because obviously with the temperatures we saw earlier this week peaking into the 100 degree index we wanted to get your insight on how some of these race car drivers could properly hydrate before they sit down in a car and if you could what's the procedure that you go through with your athletes for getting prepped for uh, an activity like this? Yeah well one of the things we do uh, first off is you know a little bit of education Um, it is amazing how much they don't know um, even though you, you think they're getting taught a lot of the, of the basics. But uh, when you start talking with them, they, they really don't even know the basics. Uh, one of the things that we do that really is kind of an eye-opener is right above our urinals, we put what their urine color should be. And that's one of the first things that we tell them is if you if you have a dark-colored urine, then, then you're probably dehydrated. You want it a little more clear, just a light yellow. And, of course, you know some of them, just with supplements, those kind of things, it can be a little bit different with multivitamins supplements but Sometimes as a general green. rule you, you you just want their their urine color to be more clear or light yellow so that's one of the first things that we tell them because uh, it is just you know drinking water you tell them drink water usually that doesn't get done so we have to kind of explain to them that it does affect their ability to play and how it's going to affect them on the court or on the soccer field and that just a little bit of dehydration um, even just two percent of their body fat that their their ability to, to play on the field or on the court starts to decrease um with just a little bit of dehydration. So that those are a couple of the basic things that we go over. When you're dehydrated, do you see t- sometimes see a correlation between dehydration and, say, mental awareness? Yeah. You know, some of the, the symptoms of just mild to moderate dehydration, you start to get a little dizzy, a little hot, lightheaded. Um, one of the first questions I ask uh, our athletes if they come in with a headache is how much water you've been drinking. I think headaches uh, a lot of times are, are partially due to, to just being dehydrated. You do get, you know, a little dizzy, a little lightheaded, and obviously, as you know, you can't be dizzy or lightheaded if you're behind the wheel. If you do end up having those symptoms, how long does it take for you to be drinking water for it to start to clear up? Prevention is the key um, more than anything, and, and that's, you know, where kind of the athletic training is probably a little different than some other health professions, say, you know, chiropractors, physical therapists, doctors. You know, we're, we are trying to identify some of this stuff ahead of time, and take care of it. So prevention is really what we hit. So we try to 
try to catch those things early on with our athletes if they have cramps, um, you know, calf cramps, abdominal cramps with during practices or games. That's kind of a red flag for us of, you know, those electrolytes are off and you're probably dehydrated, so what do we need to do to address that? So we kind of have those conversations with them of making sure you're not just drinking water, but in the electrolyte. We have a cooler full of water, bottled water, and then we have Gatorade. Which one's better? You know, it's best in combination. Uh, outside of activity, outside of when you're actually you know, on the court or on the, on the field, the best thing is going to be water. When you are replacing electrolytes during activity and right after, I would say more Gatorade because uh, it does have the electrolytes that you lose when you're sweating. So as soon as the competition's over and during competition, we do kind of a mixture. Uh, but outside of that, you know, the other you know, 20, 21 hours of the day, we encourage more water than anything. Is there a certain type of foods drivers should avoid 24 hours to 48 hours before they set down the race car to help prevent dehydration? Well, you know, I would say it's more the foods to eat, and rather than the ones we don't, it's, that's one of the things we found with, you know, especially college students is you give them a list of things not to do. And they usually want to do it. So we go the other route and say, here's the things you should be doing. And if they do have some issues and things we do, just, you know, salt, lightly salting food, the, the electrolytes that are some of the keys are especially the, the sodium and the potassium. So having them um, eating some food that have some sodium in it and even lightly salting just to, to increase that uh, level of sodium and potassium because that is what you'll lose most when you sweat. Talking with Ben McNair, head athletic trainer for Creighton Basketball here on the Front Stretch. Normally speaking, on an a- a- everyday life, how much water should one drink? Working with athletes, I, uh, I don't get the average as much, but um, I would say on the average for your average size person, they're going to say 10 to 12 cups of water per day, but that is not counting if you're doing any type of activity where you're sweating, so you got to add that on top. And then if you're bigger than the average person, you have to add on to that also. So I will usually tell some of our basketball guys and some of the bigger guys that they should be thinking more along the lines of 24 cups of water a day, and that might even be a minimum depending on you know if they're working out three to four hours a day. It, like in my modified, when I sit in the cockpit and it's a hundred and say hundred degrees out round number on the track at in the pits, we can see a hundred and five hundred and ten. Well, that by oh, the yeah. time we put our fire suit on, our fireproof underwear, our helmet, our gloves. And then we're sitting in a cockpit belted down, and the the exhaust is blowing back. I mean, you can see temperatures of 130, 140 in that cockpit. Well, I, what's the increased amount of water one should be taking in in a situation like that? And do we need to prep ourselves as drivers more so before we go racing? Yes, I would say prepping before. And the other thing I'd say is you need to get a scale. As much as you may not want to do that, I'd put a scale somewhere around there so you can weigh what you're going into before you race and how much you lose afterwards. That's one of the things we do in prevention with weight charts. When we do two-a-days and, and those kind of things, we will weigh our athletes before and after practices to see how much they are losing because we will say, you know, if you're losing five pounds of weight during a practice, you know, some athletes, well, that's a good thing. Well, no, when you're losing it during a practice, that's all water weight. So you need to go drink five pounds of water, basically. Um and it's not just the one-time effect. It's the during the two days you have two and three days at a time. And if they're if they come in say 200 pounds at the at the first practice and they've lost 10 pounds over three days, well, you know that's mostly water weight. So it gives you an idea of how much you're losing, and then it gives you an idea of how much you need to replace. And and so just that weighing in before and after each time is a little bit of an eye opener for them. So if I'm at 10 to 12 glasses of water Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then all of a sudden here comes Thursday, Friday race day, before I go racing, should I be, you know, maybe drinking one and a half times the amount of water before I go to the races? I would increase basically that 24-hour period before that you're going in. You probably start increasing a little bit more. And that's where that sodium may may come in a little bit because sodium helps you retain a little bit of water. So it may help your body keep some of that sweat or some of that water weight a little bit too. So it's a combination of drinking more water as you go into it, but the nutrition also becomes a kind of an important factor. What would be a good food choice to take in that extra sodium? Well, you know, most of the foods you can get today are a little more higher in sodium, and that's why... Depending on what uh, we, we sit down with uh, our, our dietitian and, and you know individually with our athletes and, and go through what they should be doing, we just tell them salt your food a little bit. No matter what you're eating, salt your food food a little bit. I, that, and that does kind of surprise me a little bit because I assumed that on the days when I'd be working outside, I would need to avoid the salt 
because it, it does tend to, I, I assume, dry you out, but it's the complete opposite. It helps you retain water. Yeah, it does help you retain a little bit of water for for a certain amount of time. That's not, you know, we don't encourage our athletes to do sodium all the time. <laughs> um, it's just maybe before that competition or if they've had issues with some cramping before, um, it does maybe help prevent a little bit. Nice. And you, you can get a little technical on it with all the you know electrolytes and testing blood and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, for the basics, you, you just salt your food a little bit usually helps. And what about the fans? You know, they're going to be sitting in the hot stands. We see this all the time. You know, maybe it'd be at, Cr- at Creighton basketball games especially. I've been there where it gets hot in the stands, and they're enjoying some alcoholic beverages. The alcohol is going to take more of an effect on them, especially on the hotter conditions. Am I right? Yeah, that is correct. And and partially due because, you know, alcohol is a depressant. Um, so that kind of comes into play also. You know, have the opposite of, you know, a lot of athletes go with the stimulants on the other side. You know, caffeine being a big one. And we really kind of discourage the caffeine because that also is a diuretic. So it forces more water out of your cells. Uh, so we kind of discourage caffeine a little bit uh, for competition because it is a stimulant. So athletes really like that. And you'll find that in, you know, the Red Bull and all that kind of stuff. You know, caffeine is one of the main stimulants that's used. I always have a Dr. Pepper on the way to the track because... I'm thinking it's got caffeine, it's got the sugar, it's going to pet me up. But then I know a lot of times on the way home, I've had my guys drive me home because I am just exhausted. Do you recommend maybe something like a five-hour energy rather than a pop? Because five-hour energy doesn't contain sugar or caffeine, or a little bit of caffeine. Yeah, there are some better um, better supplements out there. And, you know, those are the, that's the hard part about supplements is it's not regulated uh, by mm-hmm. FDA. So really trying to filter through and educate, you know, athletes on what's good and what's not good. Usually something that has a little bit of sugar is okay, but most of those drinks, they have to put a ton of sugar in there just to make it taste good. Ben McNair, head athletic trainer for Creighton Basketball. Ben, we've taken too much of your time. We do appreciate you spending the time with us and doing a little education. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Hopefully it uh, helped out a little bit. And you're welcome to come down to Joe's Karting anytime. We'd love to have you come down and enjoy some racing. All right, I'll have to put that on the on list to do, hopefully sometime soon. Thanks a lot, Ben. Have a good one. Yep, no problem. You too. We'll be back in turn four. We're going to wrap up the show with uh, Jeff Striegel talking about New Hampshire, plus more information on the meet and greets going on this week. Man, it's already here. It's this a coming. week. It, it's it's coming. just come so fast. This is the Front Stretch on AM 590, Omaha's ESPN Radio. This week's Legend of Tomorrow on the Front Stretch is Kyle Wilkinson, a junior at Neely Oakdale High School in Neely, Nebraska. Follow in the footsteps of his grandfather, father, uncles, and brothers, Kyle is a third-generation racer doing his best to keep the family tradition alive at Wilkinson Racing. Kyle started racing last year by sharing seat time with his brother Cameron in the Junior Hornet class. This year, Kyle stepped up to hobby stocks to learn and compete with his father, Jason. And now Kyle races Albion Speedway and US 30 Speedway in Columbus. Kyle is excited to learn from his father, who is no slouch behind the wheel of a hobby stock winning several track championships and finishing top five in national points. Kyle has plans to run his hobby stock at Riviera Raceway in Norfolk and Dawson County Speedway in Lexington before the year ends. Outside of racing, Kyle keeps busy with football and wrestling at Neely Oakdale High School. Keep your eye out for Kyle Wilkinson, this week's Legend of Tomorrow on the Front Stretch. The Silver Dollar Nationals are returning to I-80 Speedway on July 18th, 19th, and 20th. Don't miss the nation's top USMTS, MLRA, and Lucas Oil dirt late model racers as they compete at Nebraska's fastest track. Come watch the nation's best dirt track racers compete for a $27,000 to win payout. Ticket prices and packages at 402-342-3453. The third annual Silver Dollar Nationals at I-80 Speedway, July 18th, 19th, and 20th. Are you ready for fast-paced, adrenaline-pumping, wheel-to-wheel racing right here in the Metro? Get to Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs and see what it's like to race real go-karts. Joe's Karting knows it's no fun to race go-karts at 10 miles per hour, so they ripped the governors out, and now the only restriction is how good you are at racing. It's full-throttle, white-knuckle racing every day of the week. Head over to joeskarting.com for hours, prices, and specials, or give Buddy a call today and set up your group races at 712-256-5278. Get ready for the victory lap as we make our way into turn four on the front stretch. Presented by Joe's Karting. Online at joeskarting.com. 
Welcome back to the front stretch, heading into turn four. We're about ready to wrap this baby up. Don't forget, all the action for New Hampshire is on, at, on the big screens at Quaker Steak and Lube, the official watering hole of the front stretch. That also happens to be the location for the Silver Dollar Nationals meet and greet going on this Saturday from 11 to 1. Now, Ragbri is also going on this Saturday, so it's very important that you head to the front stretch Facebook page and check out all the posts that we've been putting up week all week long to make sure everyone can get posted parked and get over to the meet and greet. You're going to get your opportunity to meet guys like Kenny Schrader, Scott Bloomquist, Brian Burkhofer, Kyle Burke, uh, Travis Dickus was added to the list. We're trying to get Terry Phillips, Chad Simpson, and Kelly Bowen. It's going to be a great time this weekend, Saturday, July 20th, at Quaker Steak and Lubin Council Bluffs from 11 to 1. We've also got another opportunity for you to meet another local driver. Yeah, and, uh, July 18th from 2 to 4 that Thursday at Joe's Karting and Council Bluffs. Uh, we have 14-year-old USMTS Modified Hot Shoe. That's right, 14 years old. Trevor Hunt out of Kearney, Missouri. Drives a non- number 99H FVP uh, Modified. Uh, he's got one or two wins this year, and he's coming to tame the high banks of I-80 Speedway. At 14, I was still running over things in the yard with the lawnmower, like bushes and trees. And this guy is racing a USMTS car. I'm looking at you right now going, you, you actually got older. You look like you're still 14. I know. it's it's. I, I trim my goatee. I look like I'm 10 again. Uh, joined on the phone again, Jeff Striegel, our friend from the Motor Racing Network. Jeff, uh, we're heading to New Hampshire for the first time. So are we expecting to see a first-time appearance as we head into New Hampshire where they, they don't really know what to expect with this Gen 6? Or do you think they've begun to get a handle on these mile, mile-and-a-half tracks? Yeah, you know what? I think that's a really good question. And I think the answer is going to be we should see a, a competitive race. Um, you know, if we go back and take a look at I like your question because uh, where we have been for first times have not always produced the kind of racing we thought we were going to see. Pocono comes to mind. Everybody thought we were going to see a great race at Pocono. That was terrible. Um, I think we've been other places where we thought we were going to see some very good racing, and we didn't. Uh, New Hampshire is a tough place to get around. A little flat racetrack. You really can't race two and three wide there like we can at some of the other places. So you think, all right, based on that, we're probably not going to see a very good race. Um, I think what the teams are going to draw on is the fact that, you know, they've been to Phoenix, and that's probably about as close as you can get to New Hampshire, uh, being that it's a flat one-mile racetrack. New Hampshire has its own characteristics, but uh, at least it gives these teams and these crew chiefs the opportunity to say, how did the car handle on a flat one-mile racetrack? I hope so. I'm not convinced yet. We're going to probably just have to wait and see when they drop the green flag. Casey Kane won this race this time last year, but that five team has seemed to struggle the last couple of weeks. Does Casey walk into this saying, okay, this is my opportunity. I know we've got a setup that can win. I've got to right the ship. How how does how does he walk into it and, 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 and change that mindset? Because negativity is an easy thing to get stuck on. Well, if I'm Rick Hendrick, I'm not going to say how it. I'm not going to say how you just did because I'm. Uh, here's where I'm going to challenge you on that. The, the five team has struggled, no question. Um, the five team has struggled with people who run into Casey. The five team has struggled with engines that uh, I believe one broke. Uh, the five team has struggled with things that have been outside of their own garage. And if anybody's hanging their head on that five team. I'd probably feel like I need to put my arm around him and say, let's go back and review. We have arguably the fastest car in the racetrack every single place we go. Uh, we just don't have the results to show for it. So I think Casey goes in there and he brings everybody with him and says, you know what, boys, unless they hit us with a missile, we're taking them all down and we're going to do it the way we have been running. These guys are good. Make no mistake about it. They just do not have the kind of finishes that would show what you know what we're talking about here. I actually looked up the stat in Daytona when Casey went out, and I, I can't recite it right now because I just don't know and I don't want to be wrong, but I believe he has six finishes of 30th or worst, and the other finishes are like all top ten. So, I mean, it's feast or famine for Casey, and I wouldn't be surprised if he feasts at New Hampshire uh, when they drop the green flag, or I think he'll be there at the end when they drop the checkered flag. How's that, Jeff? Going into uh, today's race at Loudon, a lot of drivers, me, 
being a dirt tracker on Friday and Saturday nights, you know, we have our favorite dirt tracks. Well, these NASCAR drivers have their favorite NASCAR tracks that they like to race at. What is the one thing year in and year out that you hear that these drivers really like about Loudoun? You know, buddy, realistically, uh, they like to race there because it, it puts the steering wheel back in the driver's hands. And let's face it, that's where they want it. We're doing our pickums contest where the the uh, me and Buddy and along with a former co-host are, are picking our drivers and then we collect their points and quite frankly I'm a little dumbfounded as far as to who to take today. So can you give me any kind of insight who you think would be good to take today? Is it Tony who has the best record? Is it Jeff who's second best? Who who do you who would Jeff Striegel take for today's race? Well, you know it's funny that you said Tony because that's where I was leaning. We talked about him in the first segment, Matt Kenseth. You know what? If I'm a betting man right now, who would you take week in or week out right now? Jimmy Johnson or Matt Kenseth? Um, I consider those to be the two best drivers at every single racetrack so far this year, bar none, regardless of the results. If somebody said I had to pick one driver from now to the remainder of the year, don't care what track, I'd take the 20. And uh, I think Matt's the guy to beat everywhere they go. Jimmy's capable of beating him, but Matt's capable of beating Jimmy. So. I think everybody else is playing just a little bit second fiddle to those guys. Uh, I think Tony's got a shot. Kevin Harvick's on a roll, and there's a bunch of guys that flat out need to have good wins, and don't be surprised if we don't see the front bumper used quite a bit this afternoon when we do go to the green flag because there's a lot of guys that got to come out of here with big-time finishes or their opportunity to race for the championship is going to be gone. Jeff, uh, we appreciate your time, as always, to talk to us about the race coming up here at, uh, at Loudon in just a few hours on TNT. Green flag is at uh, noon here at Central Time. Uh, what are you going to be doing for New Hampshire? What are you going to be doing today to watch the race? Are you, are you going to be watching it or relaxing? No, well, I'm going to be relaxing, but I'll definitely be uh, watching it. Or, you know, quite honestly, I may listen to a little bit of it uh, on PRN. And, you know, I want to make sure that I stay in touch with it and know what's going on. You know, this is going to be a big stretch. you got New Hampshire, you got a week off, you got Indy. Uh, by the time we get rolling uh, back into August and we get back to Pocono and Watkins Glen, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of things will have been decided by that time. And I want to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm abreast of what it is and what some of these drivers have got to do to make the chase. It's been a great year so far, and I, I suspect it will be as we get closer and closer to Homestead. All right, Jeff, enjoy the rest of your weekend. As always, we greatly appreciate your time, and uh, have fun. All right, man. We'll talk to you guys next week, all right? All right, we'll see you. All right, take care. Great guy. Great insight. Jeff Striegel of the Motor Racing Network. How about we wrap it up, bud? Uh, we will post our picks of... Uh, who are you thinking for today? I, 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 I Well, first of all... I th- four I, weeks in a row, I've had the, the best pick, so... You know, I'm not bragging. I can't or believe anything. you went to Jeff Striegel for advice. <laughs> of course, are I you did. serious? Listen, this is no holds barred match. I mean, it's it's getting serious. I am one point behind Andrew in second place. You are two points behind me. The gloves are off. I mean, it's it's gone from. I mean, your generosity has allowed me to get back into the race. And and now it's I got to take advantage of it and I got to get every point while I can. I'm, of course I'm going to jump into that. And the thing is though is his advice. You can steal my driver. I know who I was. I'm, I'm considering. I've got a couple of drivers I'm considering. In. I've got a couple of drivers I'm considering. Well, who also, are you thinking? who are you thinking? I'm actually thinking Tony. Uh, that's a, a two. I'm, I'm thinking Tony, Jeff, or Denny. That's the three I'm thinking. See, I'm thinking Tony, Matt, Kyle. I, and see, I kind of disagree with your guys' take in turn one. If you had Joe Gibbs Racing equipment or, or Roush Fenway equipment, I, I'm a little nervous about Joe Gibbs Racing because of their engines. I'm a little nervous about that. But I, I understand what you guys were talking about in that sense. And so in that sense, I'm always a little nervous to take a Toyota engine. Well, you know, the one name that didn't pop up that Jeff was, talk, was talking, Matt Kenseth and Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. Week in and week out, those are the guys to beat. Well, when he's not blowing engines... There's another JGR or, or car. Getting, that's that's Kyle up. Bush. Or, or yeah, and, and Matt Kenseth, his issue has been getting caught up in accidents or blowing engines or getting fined or getting fined. Right. So it's. I mean, that's that is what's separating these two from points lead to the reason why uh, my Matt is back. I believe in fourth. No, he's back in uh, sixth. So it's going to be a great race today. Uh, we will post on our Facebook page who uh, we are taking, and we'll keep you up to date with it as are the you, race goes on. You going to Quaker Stick and Lube? I've been saying that for the last couple of weeks, and it, you know, it's 
It just depends. We'll see. I, I want to get down there, but I also Your I enjoy sitting. Your face is all boom, boom, shrimp <laughs> lined. <laughs> Quaker Steak and Lube, the official watering hole of the front stretch. Don't forget July 18th at Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs from 2 to 4. Your opportunity to meet 14-year-old USMTS driver Trevor Hunt. And then also you guys are going to have some special cart races that two, day. 2 to 4, special pricing on cart races for those two hours only. And then also on July 18th, which is the last day of the Silver Dollar Nationals, uh, we will be having the Silver Dollar Nationals meet and greet, which Bud and I will be going around rubbing elbows with all of the fans. Talking to you guys for coming out and meeting guys like Scott Bloomquist, Ken Schrader, uh, Kyle Burke, Brian Burkhofer, Travis Dickus, also drivers like uh, Kelly Bowen and uh, Terry Phillips are in the uh, you know, Chad Simpson. I'm also trying to get Chad. I'm just waiting to hear back from him. You know what's cool about this, Dan? I've been racing a lot. For, for 20 years. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> but I've been racing for 20 years weekly. There has never been a meet and greet with drivers like this ever. It's, you know, it's uh, it's a lot of fun to put together and and we've all we've all pooled our resources. And the idea is is not simply just to and it's amazing the outpouring of support that we've had to get this thing to come together. Quaker Stick and Lube has done a lot of promoting on their end. They've gotten together with Budweiser to bring us some really cool stuff. Also, uh, you know, there's been vendors that we have worked with that have helped us out. Out. And, and we're not asking for any money from anybody, and no one's charging us anything for this. It's a way for everyone to get together and meet their drivers. And, and I'm well, really excited. I ordered a bunch of stuff online at scottbloomquist.com. I ordered a little modified co- a die-cast late model of his. He's, I'm going to have him autograph it, and it's getting locked away in a safe place. Not to be melodramatic about it, but secondly... You're supporting the local dirt track racing community. Exactly. I mean, you're going to meet some of the nicest people when you come out to this event. It's going to be a great time, and we always do appreciate it. Also, with your Silver Dollar Nationals ticket, if you pick it up at the box office, which, by the way, is not out at the Speedway, when you go and pick it up at 5040 I Street, which is attached to Kaziski Auto Parts, then you can take that ticket and you can go over to Joe's Karting and you can get yourself a free race. Yep. One free race per person, per ticket, one free race. And then you can also take that to Quaker Steak and Lube on the day of the meet and greet. Go to the front of the meet and greet lines and then you can also head inside and get 20 percent off of your food bill and your pop bill but not your alcohol bill we can't take deductions off that that's a whole complicated thing but that's what you can do is you're a vip for the silver dollar nationals that goes for your general admission tickets and your reserve seating tickets so remember general admission you can pick them up at the box office at 5040 i street reserved seating because you're purchasing those at a separate website online you have to wait and pick them up from the track as of Thursday, then Friday, and then obviously Saturday. So you can't get the general the uh, the reserve seating tickets at the uh, the fifty forty I Street. So if that hasn't complicated you enough, head to our Facebook page. We've got all the information there. We're posting all the updates with drivers and stuff like that. Uh, Bud, as always, it's a pleasure sitting down and talking dirt and racing with you for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> this has been the front stretch. <laughs> presented by Joe's Carding and Council Bluffs online at joescarding.com on AM590 Omaha's ESPN Radio. Have a great day. The Silver Dollar Nationals at I 80 Speedway are less than a week away. Time is running out to get your tickets and see the nation's top USMTS, MLRA, and Lucas Oil dirt late model racers as they compete at Nebraska's fastest track. Come watch the nation's best dirt races compete for a $27,000 to win payout. Ticket prices and packages at 402 340 Four two thirty four fifty three. The third annual Silver Dollar Nationals at I eighty Speedway this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. In nineteen ninety nine, Wade Cross decided he was tired of overpaying for shocks, so he created FX Shocks. Now FX suspension customers reach across the United States with countless wins and championships, including national champion in three major IMCA classes, plus super nationals champions in all four of the Saturday night's main events. Get your FX Shocks today. One on one consultation is waiting for you at 308-383-9609. Are you ready for fast-paced, adrenaline-pumping, wheel-to-wheel racing right here in the Metro? Get to Joe's Karting in Council Bluffs and see what it's like to race real go-karts. Joe's Karting knows it's no fun to race go-karts at 10 miles per hour, so they ripped the governors out, and now the only restriction is how good you are at racing. It's full-throttle, white-knuckle racing every day of the week. Head over to joescarding.com for hours, prices, and specials, or give Buddy a call today and set up your group races at 712-256-5278. 